Next, the uprising in Syria. The Syrian army kept up its offensive today, launching raids on more towns across the country. Turkey's foreign minister met with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad today to express his concern and call for calm. Assad has defied outside appeals to stop the deadly crackdown on a five-month-old uprising. We turn now to the voices of three young Syrian anti-government activists. They were interviewed in neighboring Turkey by the reporting team of Anna-Sophie Flamond and Hugh McLeod. McLeod narrated this story for our partner, the international website Global Post. And a warning to viewers, it contains disturbing images. It was the fuse that was lit because we had this common ground. The Arabic regimes are all the same. They have the same ruler who consider himself God, the same injustice, the same inheritance of power like in Syria. So those rulers consider themselves owners of the countries. The only thing we needed was this spark to be lit. The spark was in Tunisia and went through the countries to Syria. That spark made the shift that we should go to the streets. On March 18th, 2011, the unthinkable happened. The Syrian people took to the streets by their hundreds to protest against the regime. It was an unprecedented challenge to President Bashar al-Assad and his family's 41-year dictatorship over the country. I chanted and I was happy. But at the same time, I was afraid because of the security agents were gathering and we were only around 100 people. Most of the first protesters were like Damascus native Dia Dogmash, a 25-year-old who was studying law in Beirut when the Arab uprisings began. He came home to Damascus to join a wave of young people willing to risk their lives to openly confront the regime in one of the world's most tightly controlled police states. But there were many watching. But are they security? Are they with us? Against us? But everyone looked like they were watching something beautiful passing by. I felt it coming from my inside like someone holding a guitar or a oud for the first time and has never played them before and suddenly find himself a musician. It came from the bottom of my heart. So I looked around and I saw that it was coming from the others the same way. Dia, along with two other activists whose stories follow, agreed to speak on camera about their experiences while they were safely out of Syria across the border in Turkey in June 2011. Inspired by Dia and his colleagues' early acts of defiance, other young people began to organize themselves into mass protests against the regime. One of those was Omar Makdad, a 31-year-old citizen journalist from Dara, a southern border city and the cradle of the uprising. He launched a magazine prior to the uprising and his stories criticizing the regime led to a nearly two-year jail sentence. So all the nights we are prepared ourselves, we encourage ourselves, don't worry, it's okay, what they can do, they will just arrest us, no problem. With media banned from reporting in Syria, Omar, like many activists, decided he had to document events using a cell phone camera, uploading videos to YouTube to be the eyes and ears of the world. In a clip that became an icon of the military siege of Dara, Omar filmed security forces marching through the streets in an almost apocalyptic scene. We have to film them when they arrest us to say that's for the media. But actually, they, they make it longer story short, we say. They kill us. They didn't arrest us. They let us down. That's it. From the first days of the uprising, the regime used brutal violence to try and crush its young opponents. I can't uh, 
the girls with us tried to protect the boys because we didn't think they would be girls. Michel, a pseudonym for an activist in his 20s, is from a family with a long history of political activism. He helped organize street protests in the capital, Damascus. But the security didn't have a problem beating girls. So they did. A few of us were arrested because we were trying to protect the girls. I was dragged by my hair for 200 meters by two secret police officers. One pulled me by my hair, one pulled me by my arm. We got to the car and they beat me with batons. Six of them were standing around me and the colonel in charge also beat me. So I heard a girl screaming. She was screaming loudly, so I ran towards the screams. Of course, they started beating me. They tried to get me to the ground, but I resisted. But someone hit me on my knee from behind. They stood in a circle and covered my head with my T-shirt. I managed to see a circle of feet around me, and they started to kick me. All I could do was this, to protect my face. They kept beating me, but I didn't feel any pain. Maybe I had a lot of adrenaline. While the Arab uprisings provided the spark, the desire to change their country had long been growing in Syria's young revolutionaries. I, I like to write. Just, I, I love to express my feelings on papers, how I feel, how I see my country. And all the time I make a compare between Syria and European, some European countries. Why, why, we, we, okay, we have everything we need to be a modern country. I see a bad things. Why these things is bad? Why we can't fix it? I thought I was the first, so I started a page, a Facebook group. But when I searched, I found lots of groups already there. I was happy, so I started this group and started to talk to other youths. To my surprise, I realized that they are thinking just like me. They feel the same as I do. In my opinion, I was still thinking that no sensible person would take such a risk. But for me, this is it. This is the decision we made, to be or not to be. It was uh, like, uh, a f like a war, but for us we use our camera and for them they use their guns. And we need to, uh, to film everything for media because we are alone inside. No one to support us, no one to film what's happening exactly in Syria. Aware that the internet is the main source of communication for Syria's youth activists, the regime laid siege to several major protest cities, cutting electricity in an attempt to take the revolution offline. We got a problem with the uh, batteries, because our battery is running out and no electric to recharge your equipment. So for phone calls we create a new uh, way, it's actually a simple way, to uh, recharge your phone. We used to a glass of water with two batteries, Duracell or something else, it's already exists everywhere. We used it to keep the batteries in the water for one hour or 30 minutes, then you put the uh, USB uh, adapters inside the water and start charging. That's how we charge the mobiles. Though adept at getting around the regime's attempts to silence them, Activists know that if they are caught, the consequences are grave. Who's Omar al Mokdad? They ask. I kept silent. He took the gun out and he put it in my head. Don't move. Omar's love of writing had got him into trouble with the regime. He was arrested and sent to the infamous Tadmor prison in Palmyra, in the deserts of eastern Syria, some 200 kilometers northeast of Damascus for 22 months. I, 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 I don't know how to explain this for you exactly, but it's terrible. It's not just make you afraid, it's terrible. Because you are alone, you don't have 
you can't defend yourself. Wild people control you, and it's too easy. They can kill you. I was asking myself all the time, I have to be strong a little bit. I don't have to show them that I am scared, because if they feel that you are scared, they control you. The systematic torture of protesters in prisons by Assad's security forces has been well documented during the uprising. Human rights groups describe several brutal techniques, including pulling nails from fingers, electric shocks, and humiliating detainees by urinating on them. After being tortured, people are more determined than before. Because we have this belief. After all I saw, every time I see something hideous, my beliefs get stronger. That whatever the price is, we need to get rid of this. I mean, there's no way we can continue with this regime. It's not a regime, it's a gang. All three of these youth revolutionaries are still in touch with their friends on the ground in Syria and remain active on social networking sites, helping organize protests against the regime. Despite the threat of arrest and torture, they all hope to return to Syria to continue to push for an end to the dictatorship. Our guys there, they are working so hard on the ground and I hope uh, soon the uh, They will be happy. I'm, I'm sure about that. Today, the Syrian state-run news agency reported President Assad said his government would be relentless in its pursuit of what he called, quote, terrorist groups.